Thank you, Osmo. Good, ev good evening. Um, and thank you for taking the time out of a busy, busy schedule to come along here this evening. Um, I'm gonna, my attempt is, the, the purpose of this session is to look at our style, our personal style. When, when leading, when coaching, when managing, and looking at that, how that differs across those different disciplines. Um, I'll make it as interactive as we possibly can. And what I'd like to do to start is, could you just get in just groups of four? You can stay in your, stay in your lines. It's just a little conversation group, that's all. A group that you can have a conversation with the person next to you. And do you have, so just introduce yourselves. You can work in pairs if you want, it's fine. It doesn't have to be fours. You can work in pairs. Right, can you just uh, listen to me again? Are we all introduced? It can be as, look, this is, this is a casual conversation around this topic. So you can be in pairs, you can be in fours, be threes. It's completely up to you for this first bit. Have you all got your postcards with the three circles on? Yeah. And have you got a pen? Yeah. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to start on that top circle and can you write leader in it, please? Right. In your pairs, your threes, your fours, have a conversation around what do leaders do? So think of a great leader, uh, think of somebody that has led by, think of you as a leader. What do leaders do? Okay, what do they do for, for the organization, for the people, whatever it is, but what do leaders do? Have a conversation and then we'll debrief in a couple of minutes. Anybody got any questions? No? Have a conversation about leadership. Okay, let's check in. Let's check in. So what, what, what's, uh, what's the question of what do leaders do? What, uh, when you're leading, what do you do? So what do leaders do? Just, just shout out. And if you want to make notes when you think, oh yeah, I like that, write it on your, your little postcard. Uh, so what do leaders do? Motivate. They motivate, inspire, challenge, challenge. Adapt to change. they adapt to change. And they lead change as well. They can learn from failure. Okay, well or badly. So they communicate well. Do all, but that's an interesting one. Do all leaders communicate well? So that's an aspira if you like, that's, that's aspirational, which is great, around do leaders communicate, because you know when, when you're being communicated with well and how that makes you feel. So communicate, good leaders communicate well, or if they know that communication, they're challenged by it, what do they do? They employ somebody else to do it. But that's what great leaders do. They recognize their faults and their vulnerabilities, and if they need somebody to be a communication expert, they'll bring them in and say, hey, you do, you do this better than I do. And this is the message I'd like to communicate. So it's absolutely right. And just, it's really important that we understand that leaders understand what their, where their failings are as well, and they will fill those failings in. They will, great leaders, just bring people in. What else do they do? Set Terrific. They set vision. Okay, so their focus is from the balcony out here while other people do the daily doings. They, they can set vision. Anything else? They bring people together. They can do. And that's really important as well because great leadership inspires great followership. Because even if great leaders, doesn't matter what decisions they make, if people trust them and believe in them, they will get behind them. And sometimes decisions which aren't great if they inspire great followership, 
they do get the job done. And then what you do is you, you reflect on it and you learn from it and you move on from it. Really important. Poor leaders, they can make great decisions, but if they've got no followership, actually it's doomed to failure because people don't buy in. So it's a really, really good point. It inspires followership. So when we talk about great leaders inspire, it inspires followership. It inspires people who say, yeah, I'm prepared to do that. Whether it's a great decision or not, you know, it's, that's beside the point. But it's a really good point. Thank you. Anything else? And how do they do that? Because we talk about confidence as if everybody's got it. What, what, to tell us what you mean by confidence. Having a, we were talking here about there needs to be a certain charisma or a charismatic nature that sort of makes you want to get behind them and be part of what it is their vision may yeah. be or the vision they set. Okay, yeah, I'll buy that. But equally, uh, the other part of that was, which is tied into another point made earlier, which is also knowing when to ask for help, so knowing your vulnerabilities and your faults and knowing them. Don't pretend you have to know everything. No. And that, but that's it's such an important point. If I, if I had a flip chart, I'd write this out for you, all right? But, but one of my, um, something which, which came to me once in a, in a group session, I was on a coaching program, um, and we were talking about what does performance mean? Now, if you've got a paper, I'll, I'll, if I write it, you can write it down, and then I'll take you through it. Please don't use the other side of that card, though, or if you do, make it really small, or use the side of the card with the three circles on it. We, are, we will use the other side of the card. So, so I was on this program and the question was, come up with a strap line for performance. Come up with a, with a headline. And we were divided into groups like I just did to you then. And I was with two other people, both worked in high performance sport. And one of them, who was more creative than the other, said, if only there was a formula for this. Now there are formulas for performance. Uh, Tim Galway, who wrote uh, The Inner Game, The Inner Game of Tennis. His was performance equals potential minus interference. So what's your potential? What interferences are there? And that basically is your performance. It's a simple, it's a simple equation. Mine is a little bit more complex because I'm probably a little bit more complex myself, but this is the way my head works. So I put bracket, K plus U bracket times A over P plus, on the end, AD. So you've got K plus U in brackets, A over P, and then plus AD at the end of that, equals performance. So what does that mean, you're, you're asking yourself? And the reason why I say it is this whole thing around knowledge. Because my experience with knowledge, particularly around leadership, and coaching and managing is people will protect what they know and sometimes they will protect what they don't know because they will not be vulnerable. So they will guard their knowledge with their life and it restricts them. It restricts them because if they are seriously thinking you know, that the realms of their knowledge, their parameters of their knowledge will help them in all situations, they're kidding themselves because we move on, we progress, we, we get better. And if they refuse to learn and to develop their knowledge, then they will stand still. Or they will find themselves moving from organization to organization. So that's the knowledge part, what you know. The, the, the you is the understanding. So from a philosophical point, I actually think you have your knowledge plus your understanding. The A then is how do you apply it? The P is pressure. What's pressure in your world? Time. Time. Client demands. Client demands. Money. Money. Resources. resources. This Money. is almost a one-to-one -one now. <laughs> eh? Money, resources. It's like a counseling session. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Outside influences. Families, relationships. Um, it can be anything, but it will eat away at you. It can 
Just chip away at performance. Say again? Ego. Ego, absolutely. That can also affect your knowledge and understanding. Because again, if you don't want to share your knowledge because you don't want people to judge you on what you don't know, then your ego will get in the way. Or self-interest will get in the way. The AD is the crux of this. It's your adaptation. So how do you adapt then to what you know and understand, how you apply it, what happens when pressure comes on, and how do we adapt to enable to perform, or to lead, or to manage? I think it was Charles Darwin said, it's not the most intelligent of species that will, that will thrive, it's actually the ones that adapt the quickest to the environment and the surroundings. So the adaptation is a, a, a key point, point to that. So it comes back to what you said earlier around knowledge is great, how do we share it, how do we understand it, how are we going to apply it, what happens when the pressure comes on and how do we adapt? And I think le great leaders, they do adapt. Anything else? Is that enough? And they're empowering as well, good leaders. Now this is an interesting one because the word empower, I have a slight issue with. I agree with you, they do empower, but the, the thing with empowerment, and I'll tell you a story, the thing with empowerment is, if I empower you, that suggests I've got the power to give. Where if we're really collaborating, even though I might, you might be the leader, I might be the leader, it's that ability to work together, knowing that I have to make a decision, or, or, or we're all accountable at the end, or I'm accountable because I'm the leader. The thing is with empowerment, so, Many years ago when I was coaching Rugby Union with the, with the RFU, I read a book by a lady called Lynn Kidman. And Lynn was a netball coach, and she was the best netball coach in the world. You're nodding. Have you heard of Lynn Kidman? Yes. Kiwi coach. She wrote a book on decision-making under pressure. And she had this um, philosophical approach where players made decisions, and they were encouraged to make decisions, and then they would reflect and they would stand by their decisions, so they would be accountable for them. And I read this book, and I thought, this is brilliant. This actually aligns to my personality about empowerment. This was many years ago when I thought empowerment is brilliant. I found out that Lynn was lecturing at Worcester University. And so I wrote to her and I arranged to meet her. And I was only a young coach. I'd only been coaching a couple of years. And I was very much down the route of player empowerment around making, asking players and developing players, people on the field, to make decisions and then stand by them, to be totally accountable. So I met with Lynn, and we sat down in the um, student union at Worcester University. She was quite a big lady, and she bought me the biggest cup of coffee I've ever seen in my life. It was a, a Costa, and the cup was like a, was like a bucket of latte. And I, never, I thought, wow, that's a big cup of coffee. But hey, I thought I was going to be there for a bit. Do, do you mind if I swear? Anybody? Okay, because I, I, you know, I don't swear very often, normally when I'm shocked, and on this occasion, I swore. So Lynn said, Nigel, how can I help? I said, Lynn, I've read your book, I love it, on leadership, on decision-making under pressure, on player empowerment. And she said, what did you like? I want people to be accountable. I don't want to put shackles on them. I want them to learn. She said, that's very admirable. And I said, I want to empower them. And she said, whose decision is it to empower the players? I said, it's mine. She said, that's not very empowering, is it? <laughs> I looked very much like you're looking at me now. <laughs> I went, fuck. And I left. Because she basically disturbed my world. My intention was admirable. My intention was to help people to learn. But I was doing it in a very directive way, which wasn't me because I was the one who was deciding their best needs. And I hadn't consulted with them. I just thought, you're going to be empowered, you're going to be empowered, and deal with it. Does that make sense? And it, 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 it affected me. And I thought, wow, how are we going to get over this? So that was my uh, story. I did go back and see Lynn once I'd sorted my own head out, but it did mess with me in a big way. So on your second circle, can you write manager and have the same discussion around what do managers do or what do you do when you're managing all right another five minute discussion so what do managers do we talked about leaders what do managers do
Okay, how are we doing? So, time to share. So what do managers do, or when you're managing, what, what, do, what do you do? Make sure things get done. Okay, make sure things get done. And how do you do that? So management might be delegation, <coughs> accountable for doing things. Go on. Um, setting processes. Okay, how process, it's yeah. how it's done, measures yeah. of measuring whether it's been done to the standards that we expect. What else? Motivate. 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 Say again. Okay. So again, clarity of direction from the leader, the manager makes sure that that message is delivered and, it, and basically delivered on a daily basis. Okay, anything else? Support. They support. Empathetic. They can be empathetic. The other thing is if they support, what else do they do? If support is down this end of the continuum and we're going to do continuums, What's down that end? Challenging. Challenge. They can be challenging in order to get stuff done. What else? Just on delegate, we had a discussion here briefly about delegating both up and down, which is actually quite tough for managers to do. People above them and below. It's a, it's a really, really good point and it's understanding how to communicate again with the people at the tier above. Because sometimes we avoid it, we just delegate down. But actually, you're absolutely right, great managers, they delegate up as well because they have the courage. And in fairness, in this, sometimes it's the, it's the role of the person above as well to accept the fact that they're being challenged at times and being delegated to. It's a, it's, it can be quite a difficult, and certainly in sport, people find it very difficult to, dele to either delegate or manage up. But there's a, there's a knack and a finding a way to do it. Anything else? Protect. Protect? Can you share what you, what you mean by that? Well, as a manager, you're responsible for your team and your employees. Okay. Okay, thank you for that. Anything else that managers do? Or what, what do you do as a manager? Again, we analyze, so we use data to look at and measures to look at performance. How do we use the measures then and the data? We can. This is, this is a really interesting one around data because I'm going to tell you, I'm going to just share, share something from a sporting perspective. You tell me if it works within your sector as well. Sometimes the data tells the truth, but the manager, the leader, can use their own intuition to say, yeah, I understand the data, and I understand what that's saying, but my experience tells me this. So this is where we're going. This is the direction we're going. Does that happen in, in your sector? So even though the data might be guiding you, directing you, it's only part of the final decision-making process. Some people will look at the data and make decisions based on the data alone. Purely task-focused, data, data-led. Some will go, yeah, the, the data is telling me this, my gut and my experience and my head is saying something else. Does that make sense? It's a really good point about data. Pardon? So they need to be an expert at managing. Get, managing. Yes. Right. Okay. 
But that, that's a really, really good mix. So there's an expertise in it, but, uh, but at times you don't have to know, but you have to be an expert in actually bringing that information out of your team and the people who do know. But that, there's a certain amount of vulnerability with that as well. You know, trusting the people around you to give you that information so that you can make decisions and use your own personal expertise around weighing up the information that you're given. Really insightful, thank you. Anything else? Okay, on your third circle. Now, in many business schools, they focus on the leader manager. But I think we all have the ability to do this final circle. Any guesses? Me. Yeah? I think it could all be you. The leader, the manager, and the coach. I think we have it in us all to do all three. So can you write coach on your circles and have your conversation? What do coaches do? And what do you do as a coach? Or think of a great coach that you've had. What do they do? What do coaches do? So have that conversation in your, your pairs, your groups. OK, let's have a chat. So what do coaches do? Well, how do you know when you've been coached by a brilliant coach? Or how do you know when you're coaching rather than managing or leading? What are you doing when you're coaching? Ask questions. Question. Yep, Courage. brilliant. Say again. Courage. Courage. Encourage. Encourage. Guide. Guide. Oh, adapt your style. That is very insightful because we're going to look at that next. Hey, anything else? So they encourage, they they adapt their style. They listen. Well, they don't make you answer your own questions. <laughs> they encourage. They leave. They might leave a space. Ask a question and leave. See what I did then? <laughs> they can do. It's, it's interesting, again, in there is, some people separate coaching from mentoring. Um, personally, I just think coaching or mentoring is a part of coaching. I think, I think mentoring... Personal experience, right? Mentoring comes more from personal experience, isn't it? It can be, particularly, if, so if we're mentoring a skill, it may be from a, from a personal experience. But mentoring from a, a non-skill base, so you're helping somebody, like the lady said there, to actually think out loud and answer their own questions, that type of mentoring, you don't need to understand too much about the context in which a person operates, because it's about how do we, how do we help extract the, the knowledge. So for instance, in mentoring, if, I, if, if you're mentoring me, I might set the agenda. Whereas if you're coaching me, the situation might set the agenda. Does that make sense? So is coaching more result-oriented? Well, it can be result-orientated, depending on, the, again, the type of industry you're in, or the type of, the type of coach you are. If you work in sport, then many coaches would say, yeah, it's about the result. Many coaches would also say, let's get the process right and the result will take care of itself. So there's different types of coaches. There's people who focus on the outcome, let's we make sure we win. There's people who focus on the people and the task together and say, right, how do we develop our people in order for us to win and sustain winning over a long period of time? So now it's about people development rather than winning. But again, it depends where the focus is and what the context is. So sometimes when the team, for example, is very new, your team, our team, in the agency or in a sports team, I think, mm -hmm. that year you know that what you won't be maybe the first or you won't be the champion, but it's a more of a long-term goal. It can be if we're then given the chance. Then we, we manage up, 
we, we make sure that the people above us understand what the expectations of the team are so that when we hit a rocky road, the shareholders or the senior leaders or the management or the board, they're happy with it because they're comfortable that you're the right person, you've picked the right team, and actually this is a, a learning journey. You made a funny face then. Oh, sorry. Because the thing is, some people go, yeah, but it doesn't exist. It happened to me. I, I, I left a very safe job because I'm driven by authenticity. Um, I'm driven by authenticity, being valued, and uh, credibility. And the people I was working with, they were high-end uh, rugby coaches, international and premiership. And they started to say to me, we like you, we know you've walked in our shoes, we know you've been at the coalface, now you're a long way since you've been at the coalface. You're talking about, you talk about philosophy, you talk about principles, you don't know what it's like to be two defeats from the sack and make these decisions. So on my 10th anniversary at the Rugby Union, when I had my raise in, um, I had a raise in holidays, in pension, I had a lovely buffet lunch for all my friends and colleagues, I handed my resignation in and I joined a club that was famed for sacking its coaches. Because I needed to be credible, I needed to be valued, I needed to be authentic. And made a big difference. Started winning games, started scoring lots of points, but the board weren't convinced. So they sacked the head coach, the new coach came in and he sacked me. So again, I was credible, I was authentic, I was unemployed. <laughs> it affected me at the time because we just started building uh, a nice extension on the back of the house. Uh, I had to pay the builder. I wasn't bringing in enough money. And we almost lost everything. But that was the short-term game of a decision that I made that I, I did on the backing of the family, the support and the love of the family. But the impact was that it affected me because I took it all on board. Looking back, it was a great decision. Looking back, it was one of the best decisions I've ever made. But the decision came with a lot of pain for me personally. What else can coaches do? Okay. So they can, they can put in achievable goals which are challenging, which, which drive your internal and external performance. So there's that sense of achievement when you reach something and you're always motivated because you're working towards. Just out of interest, hands up who's coached at the moment or being coached at the moment. Or hands up who does coaching. Oh, brilliant. So what else do coaches do? Brilliant. So finding the right person for the, the right role, for the, for the right person for the right role. And actually then encouraging them and looking at their strengths rather than their weaknesses. You know, in sport in particular, we always look at someone's weaknesses for why they're not in the team. Uh, but someone said to me the other day, so if you, would, if, you were, if you were offered a player, a footballer, who was too short, one-footed, and, and physically weak, would you take him? And many, you know, people, no, why would you do that? And he said, well, it's Lionel Messi, best player in the world, you know? Left, Arg left Argentina as a small boy with a growth defect. Barcelona offered, they, they basically paid for his medication. He still didn't grow very much, but one of the best players in the world. Once you know who it is, you go, oh, I'll make allowances there. But, it, but the other thing is, as well, with leading, managing, and coaching, understanding the roles that need to be filled now, but also what the future might look like from a leadership perspective is really important. And one of the questions that I ask leaders, coaches, and managers is if you had two people, all right, you've got Nigel, one, and I am competent at my role, highly competent, can get the job done, but I am ba a bad character. Bad for, you know, can infect the team with, Toxic. with pardon? Toxic. Toxic. Thank you. <laughs> Not it's just feedback. Thank you. <laughs> So, 
competent but toxic in character. Nigel, too, is incompetent but brilliant for the team. People love him, he helps people, but actually at his role, not very good. Which one do you choose? Because sometimes this is the hand we're dealt. Do you go for character or do you go for competence? Pardon? What do I want to achieve? I'm asking you. This is, this is my question to you. Don't you start coaching me. <laughs> oh, right, neither. Hey? Get off the fence. That was, that was a comment from the front. I asked a cricket coach, a group of cricket coaches, the same question. One person put his hand up. He said, that I cannot do this exercise. So why? He said, I'm offended by the word incompetent. I said, sorry. I said, so what do you want to call it? And he said, well, what do you mean? So I said, well, think of a person who's highly competent and slowly take their competence away. What do they become? <laughs> he said, challenged. <laughs> right. <laughs> hey, he did. Seriously, honestly. But the thing is, I think we can all do this. So what I want you to do now is, on your sheet, put your initial where you spend most of your time and an arrow to where you'd like to spend more time, if, there, if, there, if that arrow exists. So just put, and this is for you, it's not going to be judged, but where, where, where do you sit? And then I'll tell you a little story. Is there any movement, by the way? Is there a person who actually is, is exactly where they need to be with no movement? So you all move. Good. I worked with a group recently, and they all said they spend far too much time here, and they want to be, instead of leader managers, they really want to be leader coaches or coach leaders. Someone who has vision. Because what you're looking at here, you said it, is if, in three words, vision, process, people. And you said that, not me. Coaching is about people. Managing is about process. Leadership is about vision. If you have to sum it up in one word. And the thing is, your, your development opportunity is, how do you spend more time? I'll tell you a quick story. I worked with a head coach of a national team, did the same exercise with this person, and they put their initials over here. But this exercise helped them to reflect because this person said, I would much rather be spending more time as a coach leader because I have really good people here, but I'm spending my time here because I need to build credibility with my team. So by doing this stuff, by doing process, he felt that he could affect the whole team. And in the end, he was sacked because results didn't go his way. His reflection was, he should have been spending more time over here with the people and giving, uh, sharing vision. And let people who he employed, where do we, where, where's our, we, we, he employed good people to manage, but he was doing the job for them. Okay, can we, in our groups, just take one of these, there may, I'm hoping there's enough to go around, but just, if you can just have a look and have a discussion around what, what it means, can you, can you just share those around with as many people and just, just get in the vicinity of one of these. What they are is coaching behaviours. And the thing is with behaviours is people see it but we, don't, we, we can't always name it. And the thing is with leading and managing and coaching is sometimes our intentions are not what people see. So there's a guy called Stephen Covey who's a business coach and guru who said that we judge ourselves on our intention and other people on the way they behave. Because people don't know what our intentions are when we start to do stuff. So what I'd like you to do is to have, to have a read what's on there with the people around you, and just have a discussion around what does this behavior look like? What does it mean? There's a lot of you, if you can't get close to one, don't worry, you'll all see in a second. I'm only gonna give you about 60 seconds, 
to have a conversation on what was on that sheet that had been handed around. Are they there? Are they still being handed around? Just get close to one. And can you nominate a person who's close? If you haven't got one, don't worry, just talk about yourself. Talk about behaviours. So just have a quick conversation around what does... Ah, oh, you've got a shared experience. I'm only going to give you a very short period of time to have, you're only talking about one thing. About what behaviour is that? So share an experience. Have you got an example? It will come. It will come to life in a second. Right, I said I'd give you a little brief amount of time because what we're going to do now is who's got direct? Have you got direct? Can you come to the front? Can you give, nominate one person to bring direct to the front and hold it? And I need you to stand just here and hold it up. One person. Who's got non direct? Who's got non direct? Can you, one person, go and stand over there? Non-direct over there, direct here. Just hold it up. Further. Brilliant. Right, can you name one person from your group to come up and stand? And what I'd like you to do is look at your behaviour and you either stand towards this end if, you're not, if you feel that that behaviour is a directive behaviour or towards this end if you feel that behaviour is more non-directive. Now, is anybody here old enough to remember Mike Reed's runaround? Yeah. Right. So Mike Reed, the DJ Mike, actually it wasn't Mike Reed the DJ, it was the other one, uh, the actor. He used to have a program called Runaround, and he used to say, run around now. So when I say run around now, can you send one person up and find your place on your, this continuum? Okay? Run around now. And just hold it up and show people. There's a tin of coke there, just be careful. My only caveat is you can't go beyond non-direct. <laughs> but what you can do is move people. So you can move people. I'm looking for a continuum. Direct has got to stay at the end. Direct and non-direct. Okay, are you happy? Oh, we've got one more. We have one more. Make him feel welcome. <laughs> Empower. Brilliant. So, if you think that this is the spectrum that we can work on and we can work anywhere, can you all get to your stand up? Can you stand aligned to where you think you spend most of your time? Or towards where you spend most of your time? Go and stand within your lines, move around. Is this going to work? Sure. <laughs> I'm not sure whether it's going to work. Just stay where you are and... and I tell you what, I've just come up with a, I've just come up with a, with an idea. Point to where you spend most of your time. Point to where you spend. So use your arm and just point to where you spend most of your time. So we've got a lot down the directive end. So we've got direct, command and control, tell how and what, task focused, questions for awareness, summarize, paraphrase, empower questions for context, listen, share an experience, empathy, silence, non-direct. Okay, point to where you'd like to spend more of your time. 
Any movement? <laughs> okay. Point to the place. Think of a time when you are under pressure. Where do you go under pressure? <laughs> now, isn't that interesting? Because before we reach that point, people were doing it in different directions. Mention the word, the P word, pressure. And most people said, go down there. So if that's the case, where would you like to go under pressure? <laughs> See, the thing is, if you, think of it, if, you look, if you went to the emergency services, before they make a decision, go directive, where do you think they go? If they turn up at a, a major incident, they'll go down here. They'll go silent, they'll remove themselves, they'll look, they'll assess the situation, and then... They may they'll ask questions, very good. But then they'll come to this end and go, right, this is what we need to do. I've got a friend of mine who's worked in the military, the special, the special forces. He said, if you've got a minute to make a decision, take a minute. Because you might want to just show some silence and some reflection, take a big breath in, calm down, assess the situation, and then choose a behavior that's required for your team. And the thing is with leadership, it's the choice of behavior. Don't let the situation choose your behavior for you. It's that ability to breathe and then go, right, this is what needs to happen. Or, question, could you just leave those on the floor and go and sit down again? So if you think non-directive that end, directive that end, just have a look at the screens, because these are a couple of considerations around questions. So where's your focus? If it's on you, you'll probably go towards directive. If it's on the learner, there's more chance that you might go down non-directive route. How much time have you got? You said time is pressure. If you haven't got much, but you could still got enough, you may go this end before going this end. What's the learner's interest? Because I found out the hard way that just saying I want to empower people may not be the right, the right method. And some people, all they want is clarity and direction and just tell me what to do. So if it's the learner's interest, then be prepared to say, I'd like it done like this. Does that make sense? Knowledge. If your knowledge is high, we tend to direct. If it's low, non-direct. The higher up the chain, we can still be an expert and ask great questions, which has already been said. How many of you think this ends a little bit fluffy, a little bit soft? For this? this is where the tree-hugging bunny lovers sit. <laughs> That's me. I'm down this end. If you think that, your questions aren't good enough, and you don't, if you ask the right question and leave time and space for that space to be filled, that is uncomfortable. Would you like to see this in action? I've taken three films from Hollywood. Just uh, short clips of coaching, leadership, management. The first is taken from Remember the Titans. Has anybody seen the film? Coach Boom, played by Denzel Washington. Okay, you observe, just watch it and you observe, tell me what you think. So this is Denzel, and the sound's not on, so let's go back. How do I get the sound up? Is it on the laptop? Tech team, how do I? Make it louder. Hang on. No, it's not that. So where would you put Coach Boone? Directive? Command and control? What makes you think he was command and control? What did he do or say? I am the law. I am the law. 
This is, this is not a democracy. This is a dictatorship. It sort of gives it away. <laughs> did he always stay down here? No. Where, where else did he go? Summarize, paraphrase, empower, question for context. He did. He shared an experience. And what was the experience he shared? He did. But it's... Where did he give the feedback to his assistant coach? Exactly. So that would indicate that the, the assistant coach challenged him in front of the players. But he chose a private room to give his feedback. So again, the environments he chose was probably a more empathetic so that not to undermine the person who's undermined him. Now, th can we all think of a leader who would choose, if they were undermined in public, that they would give their feedback in public? But Coach Boom decided, actually, I can be empathetic here, and I'll give my feedback to my assistant in private. So he's gone from that end to this end, just in a very short period of time. We talked about it earlier, the agility of the leader, the agility of the coach to move up and down. Anything else? There's a terrific um, saying around empathy, which is if you want to stand in the shoes of others, first of all, you have to take yours off. So how can you totally suspend your belief, your judgment, and what you think, and actually physically or metaphorically stand in the shoes of others? So this next uh, clip is Morgan Freeman playing Nelson Mandela. This is from the film Invictus. So this is, um, Mandela has just been released from Robin Island, from prison. It's his first day in the office, and this is his first day into an office which was previously run by the um, FW clerk and, 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 and his government. Okay? Now, this is a bit quieter. I can't find the, um, the volume on this TV, but if we can hear it, uh, this is... Oh, no, it's not. This is... this one out. Interpretation of Nelson Mandela. Where would you put Nelson? Empathetic. Oh, empathetic. What, would, what did he say, which was empathetic? Okay, so he painted a vision of the future. Well, you talked about vision of the future. Great leaders paint a picture of what the future is going to look like. Did he stay here? Empower. Okay. Well, how did he empower? He did. He said, we need you. But go on, because it's gone. Yeah, so it's just building this kind of crescendo of a new beginning. 
yeah. Did he go further that way? Go on, why did he go further this way? He gave them a choice. You can do it or you can leave. That's pretty directive. But what he did then was paint a nice picture. He said, you can leave and look, there was no ill will, you've done your best, and if this isn't the right place for you, then please leave. The thing with progress and leadership and management and coaching is that if we're looking to progress and we're looking to build a team and build, we talked about it earlier, that might have casualties. It's how we can treat them with compassion when they go. We can shake them by the hand and say, thank you very much for your effort. And then, know where we're, and then focus on the future again. But I think in that clip, it's, it's an incredible clip because you're right, he goes from empathetic. How did he enter the room? Pardon? Before that. Go on. How did he say it? Yeah, but how did he say good morning? He spoke in Afrikaans. So he spoke in the language of the people who occupied the office before him. That's a very humble, you know, thing to do. And also empathetic. He could have spoken his native tongue. He learned Afrikaans on Robin Island through his guards. And he addressed the room in Afrikaans. Which, you know, that is pretty empathetic and let's, let's actually, let's go to the hearts and minds of these people first and then give them a choice. Incredibly agile, I think it was mentioned here before, incredibly agile with what he did, because he moved up and down almost at will. His voice was always soft, and still had that ability to move. And this is just one continuum. You know, when you're leading, managing, and coaching, there's lots of others, but this is just one, but just to be aware of. Like there are different styles, different places, all fixed by the context. What's the context? What's the pressure I'm under? What's my intention? What do I choose? Who do I choose to be? Any other observations from Invictus? How did you do that? By saying that we couldn't, can do this together. Yeah. Absolutely, and he mixed the, the task with the, with, the, with the people. All we want is for you to work hard and do it with a warm heart. So a real balance of get the job done and be good. I promise to do the same. The leader is telling you, look, these are, these are the behaviors that I ex expect, a role model of behaviors. I'll work hard and I'll do it with a warm heart. But if it's not for you, you can leave. Choice. Any questions? So this, this third clip is from the blind side. So this is a true story about a guy called Michael Orr, who's an American footballer. Michael was um, uh, from the southern states in America. Um, he came from a challenged background. His, his parents, one was a drug addict. I think one was in prison or, or left, just left. He was out walking the streets one day when a, a white middle-class family came along and basically helped him, took him in. The mother is played by Sandra Bullock in this clip. And this clip is his first training session as an American footballer with his college or a school team. And because he's so big, the expectation is he will be good at it. Okay? So Sandra Bullock plays the mum. Michael, he stands out because he's massive. The boy in this, with the video, is Sandra Bullock's son in the film, okay? <laughs> so let's start with the male coach. Where was he? What made you think he's directive? Body language. Body language. A couple of clues. Tone. See, it, the interesting thing now and the, is you're picking up on the, some of the subtleties of leadership, management, and coaching. So body language and tone also can be directive. He was quite aggressive, wasn't he? Because he went right up into the, into the face. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Grabbed hold of him and told him how and what to do in that position. Did he stay up here, the coach? So when did he start to move down here? Clues on the screen. Listened. Asked a question for context. So he's actually been quite vulnerable there. He didn't have to go and sit down and ask, okay, what happened? What did you say to him? Give me the context. I need to understand. He was in silence, too. Like, he was thinking. Yeah. So he's moved up and down. The, the con change of context, but he's moved up and down with that context. But you're right, most of it, the, the, his intent was down that end. But actually, he moved down here as a result of what happened. What about Sandra Bullock? Pardon? So she shared an experience with him. What else? Go on. Question for awareness, which is over here. And context. Go on. It was, but she changed the story. So this is a, another really interesting thing about leadership. Because if there are people in your team who are just not getting it, you may have to change the context. There's a, there's a phrase with it we use in sport. Some coaches coach the sport. Some coaches coach the person. On this occasion, coaching the sport wasn't working. So by changing the story, by bringing emotion into it, by making it about the people and protection, she got the best out of him. And great leaders, great coaches and great managers will do that because they understand their people. And they understand what motivates them. You said that right at the start. What motivates them? What influences them? How do you get the best out of people? By telling them what to do sometimes or by asking a question and being silent and letting them fill the space. And the challenge is being able to move up and down here without thinking too much about it rather than just staying in one place and hoping things get done. That makes sense. As far as the content goes, we've actually, that's, uh, there, there is more content, but we're running out of time. So what I'm going to do now is just open it up to questions for the last five, ten minutes. Yes? How do you um, deal with uh, leadership style clashes? So yes. I think I get it from the, the, um, from the clips that you've had, but you might have your manager and your leader uh, having two different styles but yes. needing to communicate well enough to kind of get the job done. Absolutely. And, and then much of it, if you're the person involved in it, sometimes it's, do you just hold fast and this is me and this is the way I do it? Or do we, do, we, do you actually say, I'm not seeing this from their shoes. I'm not seeing it from their context. Can you ask a question for context and awareness? To put, them, to put yourself in an understanding. Too often when we have clashes, it's, it's basically down to what are our opinions, what do you think, what do I think, and it, it's a clash of opinions rather than what actually needs sorting out. And, and, and then, it, it's already been said, what's getting in the way? Is it, is it my ego? Is it the ego of the person that I'm dealing with? What happens if I change my, my, my perception of it? What happens if I change my approach? Does that actually get the job done? Or is it me that's getting in the way? Does that, does that answer your question? I think it's a question of self-reflection first. If you think I'm not prepared to change anymore, then you've got to look for other ways around it. Because some people go, do you know what? I've done my best. I've moved up and down. They think they have, 
like I thought, I wanted to empower because that was down this end. But by choosing it on behalf of the people, I was actually down this end. You know, people who say they're creative and innovative all the time, and they think they're down there, if that's all they do, then isn't that directive? It's because they don't experience and, and explore other, other things. If that's what they always do. Thank you for the question. Any other questions? Yes. So the earlier point you raised around Mm -hmm. No, there's a question to you, that's fine. <laughs> Good coaches always ask questions, we've established that. It's, um... We are faced with this on a daily basis in the world of sport. People who are really good, and it's just our liabilities in for the team. But we have a word for them called mavericks. It takes sitting them down and actually saying, the way you behave is hurting the team. Many coaches, many managers, many leaders feel, I can change this person. But what happens sometimes when we change somebody who has got a, let's say, a, a difficult character, is we reduce their character to be somewhat normal, and we can, at times, reduce their ability to perform as well, because some of them just need that enable to, to do it. So it's where you draw the line then. Because from a, when I work with people, one of the things I try to separate is aspiration, the nobility, but wouldn't it be great if, wouldn't it be great if we could have tension in the room and, and manage the tension rather than a room where everybody agrees with the leader? Wouldn't it be great if we could develop relationships? Wouldn't it be great if our team had love and accountability? So we love working with each other because it brings the best out of each other. But we also hold people accountable for that as well. It would be great. Or ambition. And this is where this comes. What are we prepared to do to, in order to move on? And what are we prepared not to do in order to move on? And sometimes these people can damage the team. There's... Um, who has seen the Australian... The Australian cricket team that's here at the moment. They've got a guy called Steve Smith, Cameron Bancroft and Warner playing for them. And they were all banned recently. They were all banned about 12 months ago for cheating. During a match, they wanted to change the way of the game. So they gave the youngest player in the team because they felt that he wouldn't have the camera scrutinise him. And they gave him a piece of sandpaper to rough the ball up. And this was a leadership group decision. A, team, a leadership group that should have been both competent and of character. And during the game, the, it was caught on cameras. And they had to own up. And Steve Smith, the captain, said it was a leadership group decision. All three of these people were mass highly competent, but in order to get on, they decided to actively cheat. And all three were banned. Now, were they thinking of the consequences at the time? No. Would they ever do it again? Steve Smith probably won't. Cameron Bancroft probably won't. I'm not sure about Warner because they say he's great, but he does have a questionable character. What would I pick? I'd like to think I'd pick character first. I'd like to think that we, we, we put good people in our team. But if that harms the team, then how do we make sure that we've got the balance with competence? It's really funny, I'll share this with you. I used to play with a guy called, some of the older people won't, the, 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 the sort of maverick in the team that I played with was a guy called Jerry Guscott. Is anybody, you'll see Jerry on the BBC. He's on BBC Rugby. Uh, but he was the maverick, he was the, and, and the way we sorted it out, and I'm not saying you can do this in work, but I know on two occasions he was knocked out by a teammate. <laughs> and one of them was his next door neighbor who had to go back home and explain to his wife that I'm not, the, I'm not Jerry out, I'm not, uh, you know. But that, different people sort it out in different ways. It's understanding though where the boundaries are. I think you've got to be very clear with somebody who's competent but with a poor behavior. The thing is, both will let you down. They're both untrustworthy. 
It's the one, it's the one that personally you can live with. Most people can, can live with the fact that, not great, but hey, we'll just deal with it. Rather than, yeah, he gets the job done, but do you know what? I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to share a drink with him. And the thing is, in teams, is the, the, these people do exist. You don't have to like them, you know, but it's, it's can they get the job done within the, within the parameters that we put? And if they continue to step over the mark, then do we just say, you're not for us? But it's, it's a thin line. But I would, I think I would choose character first. It's, it's an interesting one, because I've done both. So I was faced with this dilemma once when I was coaching in the Premiership, where the head coach was sacked, like I said, and I had to coach the team. And there was three people to choose from. One was highly competent, one of the top scorers, but contributed to the sacking of the head coach. He was overweight, he'd, he'd, he'd played for lots of teams, very sociable, but divided opinion on whether people liked him or not. He was like Marmite. The other player, again, highly competent, had come through the academy, but was an alcoholic. You know, he'd come to training sometimes, reeking of booze and in a bad state. So again, competent, but through, through disease, would let you down. And the other one, had been injured most of the season, was physically small and not particularly good but nice to have around. Always a good, 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 good team player as far as training, training partner, do anything. And I was, had the dilemma of having to choose one. And I had a very older, a much senior coach working with me at the time and he said, what's the problem? I said, I'm struggling. I picked the team apart from one place. And he said, your job is to win on Saturday. It's somebody else's job to build the culture of this team. So he helped me reset the context. So I chose the player who was competent with a poor character in order to fulfill the task on the weekend, knowing that if I had the job of building a team, I wouldn't have picked him. Does that help? It's a difficult question, because again, it's contextual. You don't know what you're in and how, how you're gonna get out of it. And if you have to pick somebody who you don't like, but will get you out of it, and that it helps the team and the club, or, or your team and your organization, then it's how long are you prepared to put up with it for? I think it's a bit easier for us because with sports, there is the talent uh, bit as well. So when you're working in an agency, I think a toxic person can be even worse because they intoxicate other people as well who are yeah. working hard, trying to learn, trying to improve. So having that person around affects other people as well and the, and the development of other people. So if I get invited back, there's a, there's a, there's a session we can do on that. I'm not trying to generate work, <laughs> Katrina, but that, that is a session we can do on how do we change behavior, how do we instill behavioral change? Uh, what's the difference between a high performance culture, a toxic culture and a complacent culture? Because actually they're different, but if you're in a team, that the journey to, from high performance to complacent is a short one, and complacent to toxic is also a short one. But it's actually a knowing and understanding what, what the differences are and, and how do we manage people around it, and that, that can be challenging at times. Um, you know, in blind science, you sort of um, mentioned that a guy had a sort of uh, Yes. Yes. Is that something that happens in sport generally? We try and work out what their sort of traits are and then apply it. We, yeah. I, I don't want to whet your appetite, and again, I'm not tired of a business, but the second half of this session was all around personality types and, and looking at whether people are people focused, task focused, introvert, extrovert. And then, uh, and, uh, then aligning your behavior and understanding around what their needs are. So that the coach, for instance, didn't realize, just wanted to coach him as an American football player. But Sandra Bullock knew that he tested 98% for protective instinct. 
So what you have to do to get the best out of him is change the story. Don't make it about the task, make it about the people he's protecting. And then you get the best out of him. Well, there's lots of different types of tests. Yeah. I'm not sure what they use. Um, but there are things like, has anybody here done Myers-Briggs? Yeah. So that's a, that's a personality type test. Now, if, you're, if you are a, an F, a feeler, somebody who, who, uh, who relies on values and people focused, then you would you would manage those differently than someone who was perhaps more task-focused, a T. Now, I, I was going to introduce you to, I'll wait your appetite. Um, <laughs> there, are, there are others out there. There's things like insights, discoveries. Anybody use insights? They use colors. But it's, a, it's all based on, just, just to whet your appetite even more, it's all based on the work of this chap, Carl Jung. So Carl Jung was around in the same, he was a, I think he was a student of, or a, uh, he was an uh, associate of Freud. And he used to look at people and say, well, the people that I'm, I'm interviewing and looking after, they have different personality types. You know, some get their energy from people and the surroundings, some get their energy from inside. Some are more task-focused and they, they spend their time thinking. Some people are more people-focused and spend their time looking at people. The thing is that if we've got someone who's task focused, you generally need people to, to do the task. But many of the task focused directive people forget, forget the, the team. This needs to be done, this is how we're going to do it. Now, you, you know, some of the team are going, very demanding, you're always demanding stuff. Why don't you ask me how I'm doing this morning? <sighs> okay. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Right, we need to get this done. <laughs> But we can, we, can, we can talk about that at another time. You know, today we've looked at style. We've looked at, you know, where do you sit? What happens under pressure? When pressure comes on, wouldn't it be great if we could just take a very breath, silence, look at what's happening, look at the people involved, and then make a decision. And that decision might be to ask a question. It might be to tell somebody what to do. And if we tell someone what to do, be very clear, this is important, be very clear that it's what needs doing and how to do it. Because under pressure, we tend to commentate. We tend to give an appraisal of what's happening, not how, not how to sort it out. So just, just, just um, you know, putting my pressure onto you by saying, well, this is the situation. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah, but this is the situation. Right. I get it. But again, under pressure, this is what needs to be doing. This is how I'd like it done. Clear? Yes. Right, go and do it. Because the pressure's on. Not, you know, we haven't sold enough, you know, uh, we haven't sold enough advertising this month and the, the, the targets are coming. Yeah, that's commentary. What do you need me to do? And how would you like me to do it? Thank you very much for today. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for your participation.